I want to talk about conversion therapy. Yes. Okay. Conversion therapy is in the news a lot at the moment. People are talking mm. about banning it. It feels like it should be banned on the surface. What is conversion therapy? Well, that that depends who you ask. You know, tr traditionally conversion therapy, conversion practices was aimed at trying to, you know, forcibly change someone's sexuality. We had some abhorrent practices in the past, you know, uh, electroshock therapy, uh, corrective uh, things like that, which thankfully have been illegal for a long time now. Um, the modern definition of conversion therapy uh, appears to be forms of talking therapy or religious interventions. And crucially, what's been added into the mix is not sexuality, but gender identity. So this idea that a therapist who seeks to challenge or explore, let's say, a child who says that they're trapped in the wrong body, there's a suggestion that that could be conversion therapy because you're not affirming somebody to be their true self, which mm. is transgender. So when people hear the word conversion therapy, I think a lot of people are imagining it is just that it's that gay conversion mm. thing, which I think most of our society has now decided is a consensus that it is abhorrent um, and can ruin people's lives. There's loads of examples yes. of people whose lives are ruined from that. Uh, and then they'll hear that someone like you doesn't want conversion therapy to be banned. And there might be this assumption, do you think, that you might be a homophobe or you want to ch change gay people? Y yes, and that's the, that's very much the intention of those kind of spacing this position, um, because I, I've been brandished a, a conversion therapist. And if you look back at what I've said, all I've ever said is that we should protect explorative therapy. There's, we shouldn't have therapists who just mindlessly nod along when a client says, uh, I'm trapped in the wrong body. I want to take hormones and have my breasts cut off. You know, a therapist's role is to explore causation, explore options, sometimes even challenge uh, a client's thinking. You know, when we're dealing with mental health conditions, it's a very complex area. Um, so all I've ever said is that we should be keeping explorative therapy, but people say that that's akin to conversion therapy. So th this is the issue. And there's a lot of therapists out there who are now terrified of working with quote unquote, transgender clients, because they're worried that they're going to be uh, branded conversion therapists and, and, and potentially, if this legislation goes through, potentially criminalized for it. Is the legislation likely to go through? Uh, it's very much on a knife edge at the moment. There's been a few turns kind of back and forth. I mean, it's been pledged for many years. And then in the King's speech a couple of years ago, they said they would only ban it for sexuality, not for gender identity, which myself and colleagues felt was the right way to go. But now it seems like it could be back in again. The Labour Party have said that they want to introduce a kind of all singing, all dancing, no loopholes ban, which terrifies a lot of us because there's serious unintended consequences of this legislation. So it's anyone's guess at the moment. Mm. Just to make it absolutely clear, I won't labour the point, but yeah. so somebody comes to you, a child, and they think they might be gay mm -hmm. um, or lesbian or men or whatever, mm -hmm. You're, <clears throat> what would you do in those circumstances? Uh, the, the, the same thing as I would do for any other client, which is to have a, 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 an, an open dialogue and to explore those feelings, to explore what's gone on in their past life, et cetera, that's led to them to feel this way, not try and impose my own beliefs or position on it. Mm. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's my responsibility to kind of help look after the well-being of that person in front of me. Um, but I wouldn't be adopting an affirmative approach, which is if someone comes to me and says, I'm trapped in the wrong body, I nod along and say, yes, you are. Mm. And have you considered a uh, double mastectomy? It seems to me these are two totally different issues, the issue of, of transsexuality or transgenderism mm. and the issue of, of homosexuality. Mm. And I've heard a lot of people saying that as well. I mean, Andrew Doris, a lot of gay people in that community say that as well. They don't really understand. There's the LGB alliance as yes. well. Uh, and, and some people say they actually, they're not just different, but they, they can't, they're mutually exclusive. They can't possibly... Is that what mutually exclusive means? They can't exist at this. I always forget mm. which one that means. Yeah. Yeah, they can't. They're mutually exclusive, right? That they can't possibly exist at the same time because... A lot of some people suggest that when a boy uh, is gay, and, and I know this happens in like India, in Pakistan, I think it's more appropriate over there to be transsexual than it is to be gay. So a lot of people become trans so that they can live what looks like a straight life. So. Mm. Yeah. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, well, the line that LGB Alliance uses transing the gay away. Mm. Um, and that might sound extreme to some people, but that, that, that is in essence what is happening. In fact, myself and others would argue that is the conversion therapy that's taking place because we know oh. most children with gender dysphoria, if left alone, will simply grow up and become happy, healthy, gay adults. Is that right? Is that statistically it is. the case? Yeah. 
Um, and so what, what we're effectively doing is eradicating gay children and turning them into well, straight transgender uh, people instead. The, the, the LGBT acronym, it's kind of a, it's a forced teaming in many ways. I mean, we saw this with Stonewall. You know, for many years, Stonewall were there to represent LGB rights. They made a point of saying they weren't going to get involved with transgenderism or gender ideology. And then overnight, a number of years ago, they added on the T. And, you know, that's had serious ramifications for the entirety of society because now you can't, you can't separate these components out. You'd often see protesters with signs saying there is no LGB without the T. And that's extremely offensive yeah. for, for gay, lesbian and bisexual people. You basically said you're with us whether or not you like us. The more that I think about this, actually, it, it just seems insane to me. It, I, I, I actually can't, I, I can't fathom it. And if, as you're saying, the statistics show that people are later in life just turning, oh, I was gay. And, mm. you know, and, and th this idea as well, I find very old fashioned um, that, that if you are, uh, if you have stereotypically feminine traits, I have, I don't, probably don't look like it on YouTube. I've got a lot of feminine traits. I'm very sensitive. I've got small hands, right? I know that's, you know, well, that is a feminine trait, I think, a physical one. And I feel sort of quite feminine sometimes in the traditional sense of what we see as feminism, for femininity. Uh, but mm. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this, except to say that it, it does seem like it does, these things don't fit together. Well, th this is the irony. I mean, you hear people identifying as non-binary. Mm. I mean, it, it, it's also a nonsense because all of us are kind of non-binary. Uh, they have this idea that there's kind of these two poles with like this, you know, ultra masculine man on one side and this hyper feminine woman on the other. And that doesn't exist. We're all a mixture of masculine and feminine traits. And so it's it's nonsense to even come out and identify as non-binary in that respect. Um, I don't think it kind of plays to stereotypes, uh, e et cetera. Um, but yes, I mean, going back to the sexuality point, I've got a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues who, who are gay or lesbian. Um, and, you know, they, they, they were gender non-conforming as children. You know, I've got some lesbian friends who would be considered tomboys. They like to hang out with boys. They like to do the type of things that boys were doing. And, you know, they, they tell me that if they think that if they were offered the opportunity at that point to transition and become a boy, they probably would have taken it. Mm -hmm. And they say to me time and time again, you know, thank God I'm not a child in today's society because I would have transitioned and I would have ended up regressing it for the rest of my life. Wow. That's such a, it's, it's so difficult and it becomes more difficult with people who have children. I don't have kids yet, but I know a lot of people who do. And a, a good friend of mine is really worried about this. And he says that in his opinion, the whole point of a parent is to be able to guide your child around the mm. next corner, the things they can't see around the corner. That's your job. And sometimes that's going to be really difficult and you're going to have to do things that might seem to the child to be cruel or bigoted or, or old fashioned or whatever it might be. I can see why people put the LGB with the T because it's sort of minorities. These are people with minority differences and things like that. But it's also offensive in a way because it's sort of saying, well, these are the people with the sort of fetishy things, the weird things. And it's sort of, it's saying, oh, you're all the weird people put together, uh, I think, when you put them together. Whereas if you treat them as two separate things entirely, LGB and here's T, it's not making them such such an other. It's just like, okay, here's your thing, here's your thing, let's deal with each thing. Mm. And it also allows for, unfortunately, sneaky things to be brought in, in, in one bill, sort of hidden underneath, because this conversion therapy, I think most people are going to be like, oh, we've got to ban that. Yeah. And they don't actually know what's going on. Yes, well, exactly. And, and this kind of LGBTQ plus exclamation mark squiggly line umbrella is widening all the time. Um, and you're getting people now saying, for example, that there's a term minor attracted person. This is, yes. you know, uh, adults who have an attraction to children. People are arguing that that should be brought in within that umbrella, that this is just another type of sexuality. Um, so in terms of what you're saying, you're, again, it's this forced teaming. You're basically being told mm. you're with these group of people even if you've got nothing in common with them, even if you disagree on everything, you're still part of our gang, whether or not you like it. Um, and, you know, what's ridiculous in all of this is that I, I would say that gender ideology is uh, homophobic in and of itself because it tells people that there is no such thing as same-sex attraction. They say it's about one's gender, one's self-identified gender. Um, you know, there was a, there's a woman recently who set up a kind of lesbian dating event, um, and she was branded transphobic and a bigot because she wasn't allowing men who identified as women to be there. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's actually erasing the entire concept of homosexuality. Man, what would you do if someone gets brought in 
uh, to your therapy and they probably wouldn't get, well, maybe they would, maybe their parents would want them to see, and, and also what's your therapy called? Thoughtful therapists. Yes. People come and see thoughtful therapists. They take mm -hmm. the child, they've got, what would, what do you do? I know you explore, but what does that really mean? Is there ever a point where you go, okay, well, you're good. You should transition. Uh, f for me personally, and when it comes to children, no, mm. uh, I, I, I don't believe that children should be transitioning and okay. that includes social transitioning, you know, changing pronouns, et cetera. And that includes medical transitioning, you know, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. I do not believe that children have the capacity to make these decisions about themselves when we're dealing with kind of experimental, irreversible uh, medicalization. You know, we, we, we don't allow children of a certain age to vote in an election or to buy a cigarette. So why should they be able to essentially consent to being left infertile mm. uh, for the rest of their lives? Um, but the the exploration piece is crucial because we know alongside gender dysphoria, there's often other comorbidities present. Um, things like internalized homophobia, things like autism. Significant proportion of children with gender dysphoria suffer from autism. Um, previous traumatic experiences, uh, bullying, uh, abuse, etc. These all need to be worked through because in essence, what myself and colleagues would say is gender dysphoria, feeling trapped in the wrong body, hating your body, is actually um, a symptom of a wider disease that somebody has got in their body. It's not the thing in and of itself. And the hope is that if you can help someone to, I don't know, come to terms with what they've been through, to gain closure on trauma, uh, to start to accept their bodies and the way they are, that that dysphoria will hopefully go away. Do you know roughly what percentage of uh, children who identify as trans are autistic and and what why that correlation might be there? Uh, I, I don't I don't have the exact figures on me, but it, it is a significant percentage. And I think the, the reason for that is because of the way that people with autism, their minds often work. Um, and again, they can kind of attach themselves to lines of thinking that are really quite rigid in nature. So again, we're looking at this idea of masculinity and femininity. You could see how a child with autism, let's say a, a young girl with autism, if they kind of look a bit like some of the boys, if they want to hang out with all the boys, if they like doing things that are considered to be boyish, then you can see how they could convince themselves, well, actually, maybe maybe I am a boy, really, mm -hmm. deep down. It's not just that I'm a more masculine uh, girl. Um, and, and people are taking a, a advantage uh, of this as well. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of quote-unquote charities who are essentially these activist groups, you know, running sessions for autistic uh, children, etc. you know, pushing a narrative that... Um, they might have been born in the wrong body. Um, I, I, I think it's so it's so damaging. You know, I come back to the point that gender dysphoria is a mental health condition. So we should treat it the way we treat any other mental health condition, and that's not through uh, hormones and surgery. Mm. I suppose the problem with the mental health condition thing is that it's subjective, isn't it? It depends what society you're in. I, I always hear that something being a disorder depends on whether it makes it difficult for you to fit in with society. Mm. So being gay was considered one back when you couldn't be gay in society and it made life difficult for people who were gay because they had to hide it. And once that's now allowed. So that's where a lot of people will argue that the, the trans situation, you know, calling it a mental health disorder, uh, they would say, well, that's subjective. Mm. Uh, I, I, I see what you're saying, but you need to think about it from this perspective, which is that it, it, it is a fact that we have people who are same sex attracted in our society. And we've had that, you know, since time immemorial. Um, counter that with the fact that sex is binary and immutable. You know, human beings cannot change their sex. Mm. Uh, it, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if you change what clothes you're wearing or your pronouns or you take some hormones or you have your breasts removed. You, you cannot change the sex that you are. Mm. And so somebody believing that they were born in the wrong body, th th there, is, there is no basis on which to argue that. Um, that. That is why it is and should always remain a mental health condition. We, we see other types of dysphoria and dysmorphia, you know, body dysmorphia, where people have a real loathing or hatred for parts of their body. You know, it's, it's not uncommon for human beings to dislike parts of themselves and say, actually, you'd be hard pressed to find one of us who doesn't mm. dislike a part of our body. Yeah. Um, Men look terrible. <laughs> they don't look good. And I don't mean that just because I'm straight. I mean, we, it, like, objectively, it doesn't look, unless you are David Beckham or something, even if he was naked, I bet it wouldn't look good. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, try, I don't really, have never really thought about that much before. But yeah, I, I, I agree with you in the sense that. Uh, 
human beings are kind of funny looking creatures in many ways, aren't we? And men in mm. particular at times. Um, but, you know, we kind of have to embrace that. We've been given the bodies that we've been given. Yeah. The, the, the answer isn't just to kind of chop off parts of our body. Um, you know, you have to get to a place where you're accepting of what you've been given. So you can see why it's quite, um, I don't know, quite a nice idea, really, that, you know, children have been told, well, if you don't like a part of yourself, just change it. I mean, this is a different topic altogether, but we see this, you know, significant increase in the amount of kind of plastic surgery that's going on in society and people having Botox mm. and filler and all the rest of it. This is worrying, you know. Um, it's basically, we're kind of making ourselves into, uh, you know, life-size Barbie dolls where you can kind of mix and match bits of yourself. And I, 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 from a therapeutic perspective, I, I don't think that's healthy. Yeah, it's mad. It's the opposite of what we were told, I think, growing up, which is that it's, it's what's inside that counts. And I suppose a lot of people in favor of the trans ideology in this sense would say, oh, but it is inside. I feel like a woman on the inside. And But th this is where the, the logic, to me at least, is, is circular and it doesn't really work because there's this suggestion that it, your body doesn't matter. It's you are a woman, you are a man. Well, if it doesn't matter, why are you doing these things to your body, which are extreme if it doesn't matter? So obviously either it matters or it doesn't matter in defining your sex or gender. I don't understand why the operations are taking, and then the other circular logic, hmm. which is when people say, I, it's often is men to women for, for whatever reason that might be. Uh, I feel like a woman and I don't want to quote Matt Walsh because I, I don't, I don't align with him politically in most things. And I find him quite abrasive, but when <clears> he says, uh, you know, what is a woman? And it, it's such a simple question. And if you can't answer it without referring to the word, using the word woman in it, you know, I think anybody who's gender critical can define what a woman is quite simply. You can say XX chromosomes. You mm. can say typically somebody with a womb unless there has been an issue or something like that. Uh, they can't see, and, and I, it frustrates me because I want to almost be on that side because I know I'll get more points. Do you know what I mean? I'll get virtue points. People <laughs> will just be, and I wouldn't have to address this in these interviews when I'll lose loads of subscribers for it and life would be really easy, but I can't make it make sense in my head. And I do think these things, at least with children, an adult can do whatever they want, but children, I think need to, that's why I wanted to talk to you. I think they need to explore these things with therapy. Mm. Well, it, you, you, you can't make it make sense because it because it doesn't make sense. You know, we're living in this kind of postmodernism world where we're told, you know, everything is subjective and everything's up for grabs. And, that uh, you know, that might make people feel happier and make them sleep better at night. But it's it's simply not true. There are some objective truths in this world uh, and, and biological sex is one of them. It's interesting that you've noted the kind of the pull towards towards going along with this. Um, mm. narrative because you would get brownie points you yeah know, because it, it 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 is it is trendy and I think a lot of people who don't truly believe it will still go along with it because it will it will win them favor or make their lives easier um you know I'm very happy that you're not doing that but the people who are doing it are complicit in all of this to be honest and, and they're causing as much damage as the people who are kind of actively pushing it because they're they're bystanders allowing you know harm to be caused to children I think it, it comes from this idea that maybe they don't know enough about it. So I, I did this poll, I've talked about it a lot recently on YouTube, where I said, are women, are trans women literally, mm. and I put literally in capital letters, are they literally women? And I got 90% said no, but 10% said yes. And I do think among that 10%, there's probably a faction who are just pissed off I asked the question. <laughs> they don't really believe that, but they're sort of suspicious because I asked the question, so they're going to put yes anyway, almost trolling me in a sense. But there's probably a good percentage of those who, who really seem to, do, they seem to believe that. And a lot of the comments said, well, I don't really know or care, but like, can't you just be kind and, and uh, affirm and accept? And I really want to explain in a kind way to those people why that's not necessarily the... And, and historically... That's often not been the case, you know, trying to do what's nice or kind has led to all sorts of atrocities. Hmm. You know, wh where where does it end? Okay, let's say we, yes, we allow people to self-identify as whatever sex they want because that's how they feel inside. Well, what about age? There's a, you know, there's a, there seems to be a new movement uh, of people who identify as trans age, adults who say actually they feel more like children. Mm, they're creepy. It's, 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 yeah, it's very, very worrying. But, but Sam Smith it, might do that. Uh, no, no comment. Um, but, <laughs> but you know, sh should we be to be kind and respectful? Should we should we go along with that? You know, if someone says, actually, you know, I think I'm a, I'm a toddler, I'm a young child. You know, is it the right thing to just be kind and let them go along with that? That they should be allowed to, I don't know what, attend children's birthday parties, use children's changing facilities, etc. I, I would hope most people would say no. But if you're going to go with that line of logic of let's all just be kind and live and let live, then why not? But why why is it? so bad to do that with, I mean, okay, with children, I think everyone can see that. Why is it so bad uh, to identify as a woman? 
well, I, I think it's bad for all of us. You, you mean men identify yeah. as women. But I think it's bad for all of us because human beings thrive when they embrace reality. And I think if we chip away at biological reality, then I think it harms all of us because, because it harms an objective truth that we all, I think, innately know. It's affecting, you know, women's rights um, as well, you know, same sex spaces, sporting competitions, etc. You know, men have got inherent physiological advantages over women. So allowing anyone who identifies as a woman to take part in female sporting competitions is detrimental to, you know, fair competition. Um, and I think there's also something around the free speech angle as well, because in essence, we're compelling speech. You know, I hear more and more people being excommunicated from their community, uh, you know, hung out before disciplinary processes, even arrested because they've misgendered somebody else, you know. Mm. And we know that um, gender critical beliefs, as they're called, are protected under law. Um, we, we shouldn't be forced to um, acknowledge someone as something that we know isn't true. Yeah. Um, and that's what we see with things like forcing the use of pronouns. In, in advance of this interview, I actually read a BBC article about the con conversion therapy, but it was written by sort of the LGBT editor and the yes. so-and-so. And yeah, it said, conversion therapy seeks to change or suppress someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. They just use gender identity. This is the BBC. They won't call Hamas terrorists, right? They're so <laughs> careful. And there's an assumption that gender identity is a real thing. And again, I'm not, I'm just not sold on that. I don't, and, and as we were establishing before, I think even if it is a real thing, it, I mean, it's a bigoted concept, I think, this idea that you've got a gender identity. If, if my daughter wants to act like a boy and that she, she, her gender identity is a boy, no, she's just a person who's doing mm. what she wants to do and exercising her liberty to just behave in ways that she wants to do. Mm. The BBC now will just use those words like, well, this is just, these, are, these people are trying to suppress someone's gender identity. Isn't that bonkers when they won't call Hamas terror? I know those two things seem not aligned, but do you know, do you know what I mean? That they won't, they won't, they're so worried about the neut being neutral and not using those words when it comes to terrorism, mm -hmm. but with gender identity, they really go for it. Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head and that shows a very clear ideological bias on their part. And I wrote an article for The Critic recently about the way in which they are completely biased when it comes to sex and gender. I, th I think the issue is that we're having this again, enforced upon all of us. So we're told that we all have a gender identity. Well, you know, no, I, do, I don't have a gender identity because to have a gender identity means that I adhere and believe in gender ideology, and I don't. So when I'm applying for a job and they're asking me in their monitoring questions, you know, what is your gender identity? I don't have one. Um, equally, I have many people, including online, saying to me that, well, they call me cisgender. Mm -hmm. And I say to them, I say, don't, don't I don't respond to that term. Don't, I, I would, I would rather you didn't use that term for me because I, I don't, uh, I don't believe in gender ideology. I'm just a man. And they tell me that I'm cisgender, whether or not I like it. And I find that very interesting because if I said that to a man who says, who uh, identifies as a woman, you're a man, whether or not you like it, they would, could potentially call, call the police, police on me. <laughs> Bloody hell, man. So. How many people, do, again, do we have percentages? I know these things are really hard to come by often, especially because mm. this is relatively new. Do we know how many people who go through operations are what they call detransing or detransitioning? We, we, we do not have figures on this because the figures haven't been properly recorded. This is one of the issues with the Tavistock Clinic, you know, the now disgraced Tavistock Clinic, which has been closed down mm. and there's going to be new clinics opening in its stead. But, um, you know, one of the issues was they were not monitoring outcomes of their patients yeah. as they went through this, which is absolutely ridiculous. But we are seeing growing numbers of detransitioners speaking out, finding detransitioners now suing their former uh, medical providers, etc. You know, when you hear the stories of these people and how harrowing it is, and that they're left, you know, emotionally and physically scarred, and they say, you know, when I speak with them, I just wish someone had challenged me. Mm. I wish one of the adults in the room had challenged me, including my therapist. I wish my therapist had challenged me. Um, and they carry a lot of the weight on their shoulders because they say, well, ultimately, I made the decision. But I would say that they should never have been allowed to make that decision in the first place, and it's our fault as a society. Yeah. And we do take charge in society sometimes. We do get involved, rightly or wrongly, with sort of betting, for example. They try to curb betting. They try to curb uh, drug consumption and things like that because society has agreed, again, rightly or wrongly, that people should not be able to overly overdo these things. Mm. I, mean, I mean, I get 
buyer's remorse with everything. I don't remember ever buying any clothing that I didn't immediately afterwards go, oh, this doesn't, why did I get, why have I done this? And I don't mean to belittle what trans people go through and to suggest that gender dysphoria is like just buying some clothes or anything. But the point is, it, it, I mean, it's obviously much more dramatic. So if I can get that from just buying a t-shirt or something, go, God, what have I done? I can only imagine being young, firstly, like 18 or younger than that, and going about something like this, which you, you can't reverse it, can you? Really? No, no, the, no, nothing is truly reversible. Um, and, you know, you're saying that as an adult. Mm. Um, and But we know, you know, uh, that human beings are fallible creatures. And we, we all know that we all have made many great deal of mistakes over the course of our life and made many errors of judgment, etc., and been convinced of things that we later found out weren't correct, particularly when we're children. I mean, you ask a child if they're, you know, how sure they are about something, they are always 100% sure of whatever they're feeling in that moment because they feel things in a very strong way. And also they don't have the full facts at hand. And also they don't necessarily have the brain development and growth and capacity to actually weigh up all of these factors together. So if you're asking, a, you know, a child who's been told in school that it's possible to be trapped in the wrong body, you know, are you trapped in the wrong body? They're going to say, yeah, you know, yes, I am. And they're going to sound very convincing about it. But we have to remember that they are children and we're adults. But we've got this strange scenario in society where we've got a, you know, a state that's trying to kind of, well, they might say safeguard its population, et cetera, but kind of prohibiting even adults from doing things. I mean, Rishi Sunak, you know, recently announced his kind of uh, smoking ban that he's looking to implement, which means that, mm. you know, at some point in time, there'll be people in the 40s and 50s who can't buy a cigarette, and yet there's 10-year-olds out there who can take puberty blockers. It, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. Man, that's crazy. There's another reason as well not to ban gay conversion, and I know that it's going to sound controversial, uh, but I used to live in South America for about seven years and I was looking into all sorts of stories there and I know that they banned gay conversion. So not just conversion therapy, but I'm talking about gay conversion um, as an addition here. They banned it in Ecuador. And as happens when you ban something, there becomes the, uh, the, that creates a black market often. So we know that you know by banning prostitution, it means it's not regulated. And so what does go on, you know, there's pimps and things involved. Uh, by banning certain drugs, of course, it means the drugs are now not safe. They're not monitored in any kind of way. So in Ecuador, what was happening since they banned gay conversion, I understand why they did, because it was just out of control there because of a very Catholic population. Um, kids were just getting kidnapped in the night by these zealous priests and things like that, churches who had heard that kids might be gay or whatever. They would be kidnapped in the night. Often the family would have colluded with the church and taken underground. No one could find them for about six months. They were just in some sort of hidden place. They had like things over their head. They couldn't see where anything was. And they were basically abused and tortured for six months to try and get the gay away and then let back onto the street. Some people would never, ever returned. So that's how bad things got. And I think that's something that with gender conversion, gay conversion, that's something that most people I think aren't aware of and, and need to think about. You know, do you want, it's, maybe it's awful that there's a therapist trying to explore these things. Maybe you think that's awful, but the alternative might be some church coming and getting you in the night and all sorts of unregulated things. Well, I mean, there's huge unintended consequences of this legislation. You know, again, I come back to the point that these things we spoke about earlier that are kind of you know, historically considered conversion practices are already illegal. You know, I have people saying to me on mm. on Twitter, et cetera, um, you're allowing the torture of children. And I always say to them, it's already illegal to torture people in this country. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's a complete and utter red herring. What we're talking about here are conversations um, between, a, between a therapist and a client or between a, you know, a religious minister um, and someone in their community. But it's a real slippery slope. And we've seen this in other countries that have banned conversion therapy. For example, in Victoria, the state of Victoria in Australia, they ban conversion therapy and their human rights commissions come out and said there's now they believe it could be conversion therapy for a parent who doesn't allow their child to take puberty blockers. Wow. And these parents could be criminalized and even chucked into jail for that. You know, on, on what plan is that conversion therapy? So this is what it, this is the issue. It's basically compelling people to affirm children into medically transitioning. And that's extremely dangerous. Um, and it's going to have a real chilling effect on the therapeutic profession in this country. You know, I, I was I was kicked off my master's degree in psychotherapy for daring to say that we need to safeguard explorative therapy for vulnerable children. Um, and if that can happen without a legislative ban, then imagine what's going to happen to therapists if this ban goes through. Mm, I think that's what I want to say to the people who, who were maybe annoyed at me for asking the question on YouTube the other day about 
you know, our, our trans women, literally women, if, and, and saying, what's the problem with going down this this path? I just want to say to them, I mean, if have have they got kids or have you got kids? And do you want to be in a situation where there's no therapeutic option if they are feeling this kind of thing, except to go, for and mm. go forward and affirm and change their bodies and change their minds and change everything? And then years later, those kids might, they might love it, but they might hate you for allowing it to happen. It's tough, you know, and I, it's it's tough for parents. And I often have parents contacting me and saying, well, you know, what what do I do? My child's just come out and said that they're trans. And I, I think as best as possible, it's trying to strike the right balance. I think if you come down it too hard, if you say, you know, no, uh, I don't, you know, I'm not even listening to this nonsense, you know, something of that nature, that's going to simply, I think, push your child further into the arms of people who I would say have got ulterior motives um, and, People who are saying, you know, blood, you know, family isn't blood. I've heard that from the charity Mermaids before. Um, So I think you might alienate your child if you do that. Um, At the same time, saying, of course, you know, darling, whatever you say, you know, I just want you to be happy. Well, that's, as you've just alluded to, has its own risks associated with it. Because if they do go medically transition and then spend the rest of their life regressing it, you know, the impact on them and your relationship and your family as a whole. So I think it's about making children feel heard because if they're feeling this way, that can be very debilitating. And no one's denying these, you know, these feelings are real. If a child's saying they don't feel like they belong in their body, we need to listen to that. Mm. Um, the answer isn't to say, okay, how about we change your name and pronouns and let's uh, buy you a breast binder while we're at it. The steel man argument. Let's do a steel man here. A hypothetical building up their argument, the other mm. side's argument to the best it can be. And it is true that, I mean, look, if I wanted to be trans, I wanted to become a woman. And if I knew that from the age of like nine and, and by the way, I say this fully, you know, I don't think that children should have this happen to them because they're just way too young. But it is un- it's an unfortunate fact that if you started it at a very young age, you would, have a, you would be far more likely to actually be able to pass as that other sex. It is a shame if they are going to do it anyway, that they have to wait till they're 25 until it's properly happened. And by that point, got an Adam's apple and sort of bigger, bigger hands and all those kinds of things, you know? Does that not maybe say something about, you know, and, and make us question, what, what on earth are we, are we doing here? That we're telling children effectively, yeah, we're telling them, look, your life will be easier to transition going forward if you transition as young as possible. It's, mm. it's, it's kind of, what message does that even send about puberty? It, it, it makes puberty out to be something evil that's kind of out to get them, they should be fearful of, whereas puberty is a completely natural thing. And again, with gender dysphoria, the vast majority of children with gender dysphoria will settle into their bodies if they're simply left alone and go through puberty. Um, you know, we take a young girl who's just started puberty, her body's changing. She's maybe getting, I don't know, unwanted attention from boys and, and males around her. You, you can understand why a young girl who's going through all these changes might say, I want this to stop. And when someone says, by the way, we've got a pill for that, you can see how appealing that might be. But puberty is not the enemy. You know, we've been going through puberty since time immemorial. It can be uncomfortable. It can be awkward, etc. But by and large, we come out the other end of it, accepting, you know, and embracing ourselves as we are. I think it's so dangerous to give this message to children and their families, you know, the younger you start, the better. And there's another reason for that, which is that if you start puberty blockers before you've actually commenced puberty, which is becoming increasingly common, and then you directly go on and progress to cross-sex hormones, you can be left infertile. Are we really going to play with our child's, uh, our children's kind of future fertility? So is that legal at the moment, puberty <laughs> blockers for yes. kids in the UK? Yes. I just... I don't know. I just, I just, I just don't. I just don't know. Well, the, the NHS and we're wait. They've 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 gone out for a consultation on this, but NHS England have recently says that they their intention is to basically prohibit puberty blockers outside of the context of clinical trials. I mean, that's a, that's a very significant positive step in the right direction. I, you know, I don't believe that this should be used in clinical trials. I experimented because, children. Well, yes, ex- precisely. But it's it's certainly a, a, a world apart from the position previously. So I I sincerely hope they kind of retain courage and follow through with that. And I'm sure they'll receive a lot of backlash from these activists that, activists out there. But you know the stakes are far too high. And we should not be experimenting with our children's health and futures. I feel so sorry for. I think that I really feel sorry for the parents involved in this. And I know it's still rel- it must be relatively rare. Do, do we know? Is it relatively rare? Uh, children with gender dysphoria. Uh, if, again, we don't have the statistics on it. You know, it, it, it's definitely a minority, but it, it, it is increasing um, mm. because... Social contagion. 
Well, precisely. And, you know, it's not uncommon to hear of multiple children in a single classroom coming out as trans within weeks of one another. And, you know, children being taught, there was an article in the BBC recently uh, aimed at children that was told them that there's over 100 genders. I mean, it's kind of almost become a bit of a pick and mix mm. now. So um, I think you've got a kind of cohort who are feeling this debilitating dysphoria and disconnect with the body. And I think you've got another cohort who are, of children who are kind of see it as a bit of a, a bit of a trend these days, a bit of a fad. I mean, it's kind of to be straight and cisgender is seen as kind of stale and boring in mm. today's society, which is which is quite worrying. Yeah. Yeah, it must cause a lot of shame. I mean, there's so much shame anyway. I remember just being a kid myself, how difficult it was. I was ashamed of everything. In today's world and with social media, I just can't, I sound like an old, I've become old overnight suddenly. In today's world, or oh, the social media and all that stuff. But no, I do feel sorry for the parents because you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because if you don't then affirm your child, you don't know that maybe in 20 years they really do go through with it. And maybe they are happier living as a woman or living as a man. Maybe they are just happier. And they're going to resent that parent for life. The opposite, I think, is even worse. They go through with it and regret it. Their body's completely not what they wanted it to be. And they go, Mom, Dad, why did you let me do that? I just don't think you can win. It's such a horrible situation. Um, tell me again why you were expelled from the college. Um, so this was I, was, I was three years into this master's degree. This is at the time that the government were first announcing they were going to ban conversion therapy. I and others had serious concerns about this. I was counselling children at Childline at the time, um, which is part of the NSPCC. More and more children telling me they're trapped in the wrong bodies, they want hormones, they want surgery. So, you know, so I was reading up and researching this and becoming increasingly concerned. And so I, I wrote a petition to the government saying, if you do ban conversion therapy, can you please protect explorative therapy for children? Um, and that was basically the catalyst for it. Uh, you know, I, I did the petition, I did a few interviews and articles. My place of study received various complaints, I think, about me. And then one day, out of the blue, I received an email telling me I was being expelled with immediate effect. Is a, so what is a petition? Is that in, like, it's a public thing and people are all just putting their names down? Yeah. Any, anyone who's a citizen, a resident of the United Kingdom can write a petition to the government. I think the petition I did, I think it got 10,000 signatures within a week or two, which meant that the government had to respond to it, which they did. It was yeah. quite a favourable response, actually. Um, but yes, my, my institution told me that I had brought them into disrepute. Mm. Um, yeah. The scariest thing about what happened to you, and just, just thinking from a personal, a human viewpoint, is that you got an email mm. and it wasn't like, we're going to have to have a talk. We're going to have to talk about this and discuss and blah, 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 and hit, bring your defense and so on. It was just, you're out. It was, it was, you're out. It was, th there was no policy attached. Um, there was no evidence attached. Uh, there was never a hearing. There was never an appeal. I couldn't even respond to that email because they'd already blocked my university oh. email address. And then that night, they went on to Twitter and publicised the fact that they had expelled me. How did you see the email then? So did you sign in through your email, your university email? Yeah, I had that. I had my university emails kind of being pushed through to my phone. So I received the email. Oh. I look at it. I panic. I think surely there's been some sort of you know, horrible mistake here. I go to respond and there's an immediate bounce back telling me that my address has been blocked. Wow, that sounds like a like a childish person who's gotten in an argument and like, I'm going to send my bit up, block, don't want to see the rest of it now, done. I just can't believe that happened. Um, and they thought that was just going to be fine and if they block you, they'll never hear from you again and that's it, goodbye, you're not in the college after three years wasted. How, how do you, I want to get into into the feel, the feels here because otherwise it's a, I don't want a sterile, into, sure. you know. What, take me through the feelings when you see that email pop up. I've, ne I've never experienced anything like that. It was, it was initially, as I said, sheer disbelief. I thought that there's, there's got to be some mistake here. And then when I realised that this was actually happening, I, I, I felt this sense of this sense of loneliness um, and sorrow that I don't think I've ever felt in my life. I mean, I was I was in a heap on the floor crying because, you know, I'm not somebody who cries very often, but you know, I devoted three years of my life to this, tens of thousands of pounds. All I wanted to do was to train and practice as a therapist and help people with their issues. And, and here I was raising genuinely held concerns about children's safety and well-being. And for that, I was excommunicated and my entire future life plans were kind of, you know, thrown under a bus. Um, and, you know, it's two and a half years ago this happened, but as we're talking about it now, I still can't quite believe it happened. Were you? Where are you in this moment? You're sitting in like in a college dorm, university 
Don't and I was know. actually sat, thankfully, I was actually sat in my mother's house at the time. So she was there to kind of console and comfort me. Um, you just go, mum, you won't believe the email I just got. Yeah. What does she say? I mean, what, you know, what, what can you say? As I said, I was, I was in bits and it, it took me, it took me a while to kind of pick myself up from that um, and tried to kind of gain some control over the situation. You know, it's, it's only when I started speaking to colleagues and they said, you know, maybe you should speak to a lawyer. Mm. And, you know, I did, I had a conversation with a lawyer who is now my lawyer <laughs> in my litigation. Um, and after that conversation, I felt that I'd taken back some semblance of control. You know, when I lodged the claim against my place of study for discrimination against my beliefs, and that's a case that's still ongoing, you know, I felt like I'd taken something back again um, and that I at least had an opportunity to seek justice that I'd been deprived of. What really upsets me and it always upsets me with society is this refusal. That, do you know Hanlon's razor? Hanlon's razor, I, I never remember the exact phrase, but I'm quoting it all the time now. Never attribute to never attribute malice to something that could be explained by mm. s stupidity or whatever it might be. Mm. That they couldn't have assumed, let's say you were wrong, that you were just being uninformed, you were being stupid, you had misunderstood something. They immediately assume malice that you wanted to be evil. And that's not how humans think. And if anyone should know this, it's it's therapists and psychologists and these kinds of people. Well, th that's completely right. You know, and when I finally got hold of their policies, it, it gives you um, causes for when they might expel somebody with immediate effect. You know, I'm looking down through this list and one of them is if you sexually assault another peer on campus. So they, they were equating me writing a petition to the government as a resident of the United Kingdom trying to safeguard therapy with sexually assaulting somebody, in essence. Well, that, that could have been like the most extreme of the reasons they expel people, and there might be less extreme reasons they expel people as well. I guess they're saying bringing, you in, bringing the university into dis disrepute. Well, that's what they're going to, I think, try and argue when this gets to court. Which college is it, the university? It's, it's called the Messanoia Institute. It's, it's a therapeutic training institute. It's accredited by the University of Middlesex. What's going on now? Uh, it's a slow process um, because I'm also, I'm not just suing them, I'm also suing the one of the main regulatory bodies for therapists, um, the UK Council for Psychotherapy. So it's been a very long process. We've been caught up in preliminary battles and appeals. And so I'm still waiting for a trial date, ultimately. You know, I'm, I will get there in the end. Um, I've had to crowdfund the money from members of the public, which I'm extremely grateful for. You know, I've, I've received thousands of small donations, um, which has allowed me to bring this litigation in the first place. So I'll always be immensely grateful for that. And I just need to hope that justice is ultimately done um, because I don't want this to ever happen to anyone else again. And what happens if you win? Do you get... You get money to make up for the the years you missed of college or like what, what's well that that's all that that's all they can really do this tribunal you know they can award me damages and compensation um you know which, which will go somewhere to saying that i you know i'm feeling that i've had justice but it's it nothing can undo what's happened to me you know i, I can't go back again i i won't be going back onto that course again um you know, I, I was on the cusp when this happened of literally setting up a private practice and seeing clients, and that was going to become my full-time vacation, and it was essentially robbed from me. So, uh, you know, I, I can't get my life back again as it was, but as I said, I can make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone again. And I've had students on other courses reach out to me, say they're terrified of speaking out because the word the exact same thing will happen to them. And so I need to make sure that doesn't happen. What can you do for, can you practice as a therapist? Can you, what can you do going forward? Um, well, can you I, finish I, the course? Not, not, not that course, um, and that was really only w one of the only suitable courses for me because I've I've got a full time job to keep a roof above my head, and that was the only course of this branch of therapy that operated on weekends. So it was essentially for me the only course that I felt that I could do. Um, maybe in the future I might try and go back into the world of therapy, but you know, actually this weekend I'm speaking on a panel about the politicisation of therapy. I'm the entire profession has been taken over by. Um, you know, divisive ideologies, gender ideology, critical race theory, et cetera. So I, I, I'm concerned generally about what's happening with this profession, and I think something needs to change. Yeah. Um, but as it stands, I'm not sure I'd feel able or comfortable to work within it.
Therapy was a complicated enough thing just when it was the arguments between oh, Freudian or Jungian and like, who do we go for? I lived in Argentina for many years where they're really into Freud. They love the <laughs> Freud stuff. Uh, and then you come back to the UK and everyone's a bit snooty about that. And oh, you do your Freud stuff, you hysterical <laughs> Latinos with your Freud dream shit. That was enough without all the politics coming in. I guess it is a complicated thing because everybody does have different politics. We've all got different ideas of how we want the world to run. Some people are big believers in critical race theory. Some, some believe in gender ideology and you want your mm. kid to go where I mean what do, you, what do you even do with that you go back to basic principles of therapy which are empathy exploration and crucially active listening listening to what someone else has to say to you so when you've got therapeutic bodies shutting down people including their own members because they raise concerns they're not engaging in the kind of foundational principles of therapy. We should all be able to have respectful, open dialogue. Mental health is a very complex, very sensitive area. Mm. Um, so we should be having these important professional discussions rather than trying to shame people or shut down people for their beliefs because we, we shouldn't do that to our clients when they're sat in front of us. So we shouldn't be doing it to each other either. The problem with a lot of the politicization and the affirmation, I think, my personal experience of therapy, I went to therapy in Argentina. It was great. I, 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 I loved it. Uh, it was I guess it was Freudian, but we didn't do any Freudian stuff. It was just a guy listening and we talked. Uh, and it helped me so much, just a year or so that we had. Uh, and I was I was all right, I was fine, but I thought I'll go and see this guy. And it took like six or seven months for me to have a bit of a breakthrough really. And he said that most people have that, which is that they come in and the first things they say are, you know, my mum this, my girlfriend that, they're all doing these things, everyone's against me, they're all doing that. And six months later, they're sort of saying, okay, they are a bit that way. I'm not saying they're all angels, but I can't control that. And I can only control me. And I can, you know, and that's not to say other people are not toxic influences in your life sometimes. They are. But it was that kind of, I guess it was a Jordan Peterson-y kind of make your own bed, look after yourself. And that helped me so much to understand people around me, to not try and control how they are. It was just huge. Like, I can't believe, and if someone had just told me that before, it wouldn't have worked. I needed a long time of starting to understand that I can't blame other people and I can't make them be mm. how I want them to be. Even if it seems obvious they should be a certain way, I can't, and, and to enjoy that lack of control rather than, than, than you know, stress yeah. about it and just be like, okay, well, I can't make them be. To, if I had gone in and they just said, like, affirmed everything, like, you know what, your your girlfriend is this, your your mum is a bit of a bad person, and all these people, if they had done that, I, I don't think I'd have relationships with them anymore. You know, that's that's the problem. And, and you you know, that's not what you go to a therapist for. You might go to, you know, down to the pub with your mates for that. You know, you want someone to affirm what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, your wife really <laughs> mistreated you. Yeah, she shouldn't have said that. That's not what a therapist's duty is. You know, what I heard from what you were saying there, which is very nice, dear, was around this idea. I think the word that came to mind was acceptance. And I think human beings, particularly in this day and age, when we're told we can be anything we want, we can change our bodies, you know, the world's our oyster. It, it, it really isn't. You know, we can't actually just be anything we want. Life has limitations. It's uncertain. It's unfair. I found it myself and I'm still on this pathway and I'm still resistant to it. But when I can accept things as they are, I find that to be extremely freeing. Mm. And this goes back to the trans stuff again. What we're trying to get people is to accept their bodies rather than trying to change everything, searching for something that is essentially impossible, which is perfection. I think it's a control thing, isn't it? We've yes. all got everyone, everything in my life now, and every time I see anything like wrong with people or people are upset, they're angry, I think it's control. I had really bad obsessive compulsive disorder when I was a teenager, so I didn't sleep. I was turning lights on and off all, the, all night, all that kind of thing. It was, and it ruined my life for a couple of years. It was bad. Just And I came to realize it was about control. That's what it's about. I couldn't control my environment. I grew up, uh, my my, uh, my parents were divorced, so I was the man of the house from when I was 11. So it was just like, is everything okay? Check the doors are shut. And I needed to control everything. And now I see that in everyone a little bit. Everyone's got a little bit of needing to control and make things perfect. And if we can't make them perfect, we get so stressed. We can't handle uncertainty. We can't handle saying, I don't know. So that's why that word acceptance, just going, taking a breath and just going, oh, I can't control that stuff in my life. And, and it's okay. Because I'm going to die anyway, which is sad. But <laughs> no, you, you, you're right. Control and fr and freedom. You know, um, I think freedom causes a lot of existential crises out there. We like to think as human beings that we we want as much freedom as possible, but when we have it, we actually don't really know what to do with it. Yeah. I and mean, you can take a simple example: if you go to a restaurant and there's a oh. hundred options on the menu, people become paralysed with indecision. 
um, because they feel like there's a real onus on them to make the right call. Human beings generally actually do far better where things are more neatly set out for them. There's a set pathway to follow. But again, we're living in this day and age where you're told, be anything you want, have your own inner self-identity, no matter what anyone else says to you. And I think that can cause people to kind of have this real pressure of, I need to make the right decision. I'm in control. I need to make the best possible decision for me. Whereas actually, as you just alluded to, so much of life is unfortunately outside of our control. And all mm. we can do, I think, to live healthy, happy lives is to just accept that. Mm. You can learn to embrace it, I think. And embrace it, yeah. Yeah, just, I'm, I'm here for the ride. I, they mm. say people in arranged marriages are happier in, uh, on average than people in, in choice marriages because there's less choice. There's less of that, did I make a mistake? It's like, well, that's not even on the table. I, I'm, you know, I came to the restaurant, that was my one option. I married, I had to marry this person. I'm not in favor of it because it speaks against my ideas of liberal individualism, right? But, you know, you weigh up your ideas of, you know, philosophy against happiness and it's more complicated than it looks, I guess. Completely agree. Where can we send people to help or to see more of your work and stuff? Uh, well, I'm addicted to Twitter, essentially, so you can go on there. Um, it's just my name, James S. I've got a Substack where I write various articles. Again, just type my name into Google. And I've got my crowd justice page, which is basically my fundraiser for my legal case, um, so people can go on and read about the case and can donate if they feel inclined to do so. Mm. Um, I'm going to keep speaking out about this stuff. I think my university thought that I would just kind of disappear off into the sunset, Um They've, they've messed with the wrong person, unfortunately, and I'm going to seek justice for myself and for all of those who have been harmed by these ideologies. And if you really want to understand just how deep and how far this goes, then you've got to watch my episode with Graham Linehan, who has been absolutely cancelled beyond belief for his beliefs, his gender-critical beliefs. So make sure to watch this one, click it. It's a great episode.